Now, by now, we've all become pretty efficient at avoiding dumb things, you know, dumb things like hugging people, shaking hands at a time where we just can't do that, non-essential travel, six feet apart, grocery store, washing our hands, don't touch the gas handle, you know, no face touching, uh, wiping knobs after you, before you touch them, uh, or frankly, not even touching knobs at all. Our country's learned a lot. We've learned about social distancing. We've learned about the hands. We've learned about... Uh, uh, staying away, at least during the time that this is even uh, a little bit around uh, this disease or, or whatever you want to call it. Life in America is on a pause in an attempt to stop this virus. Well, we have more than 80 million Americans, that's a lot, who are staying home due to state orders. Now, that's undoubtedly slowing the spread of this virus, which is a very good thing. More than 550 Americans have now succumbed to COVID-19. We don't have a breakdown yet on median age or whether they had underlying conditions, but we will at some point. And of course, we on the Ingram Angle know every life lost is a tragedy. Every life lost is irreplaceable. But we're testing a lot more people. It's a really good thing. And we're finding that more Americans are infected. But as the president noted tonight, we're gathering new data on mortality rates as well. The mortality rate's a big thing for me because uh, I think we're very substantially under 1% now. That's, that's, uh, it's still terrible. It's still the whole thing. The whole concept of death is terrible. But there's a tremendous difference between something under 1% and 4 or 5 or even 3%. So that's something that we're learning now. And I think the number may be lower than people think because of what I've been saying. Now, we're now just at the end of day eight, with seven days more to go of our national timeout. The president, with a multi-factored analysis, rightly raised the unintended consequences of a prolonged shutdown. You can't keep it closed for the next, uh, you know, f for years, okay? This is going away. We're, we're going to win the battle, but we also have, uh, you know, you have tremendous responsibility. We have jobs. We have uh, people get tremendous anxiety and depression, and uh, you have suicides over things like this. When you have terrible economies, you have death, uh, probably in, I mean, definitely would be in far greater numbers than the numbers that we're talking about with regard to the virus. And of course, we all know that along with the human death toll of the virus, as the president discussed, the economic carnage is mounting. One of my old friends from El Salvador called me today and she was crying. Her husband lost his plumbing job today. Her sister lost her marketing job on Friday. We are going to save American workers and we're going to save them quickly. And we're going to save our great American companies, both small and large. This was a medical problem. We are not going to let it turn into a long-lasting financial problem. Of course, some in the press, being the simpletons that they are, they want to make this a struggle between Dr. Anthony Fauci of the CDC and the president. If we get to next week, we're deciding, you're, you're deciding what to do with these guidelines, whether to ease them or reinstate them for another 15 days. Will you follow the advice of Dr. Birx and Dr. Fauci if they say you should maintain them for and two others, more weeks? Yeah. And others, Then ultimately I have to make a decision. But I certainly listen to them. I listen to a number of people. But I have a lot of respect for Dr. Fauci and for Dr. Birx. And I'll be listening to them and others that we have that are really doing a good job. Now, in the end, it's the president who is the one tasked with making the tough calls. That's why he was elected. Now, in peacetime and in wartime, he has the same responsibility. He gets a lot of inputs. He convenes a lot of meetings with a lot of smart people. And he looks at the data and the projections. But the final decision always rests with him. Now, we all know that in life, there are inherent risks. We live with those every day. When we step into our cars, when we, yeah, frankly, we just walk out the front door. It's always a balancing act in life and in politics between freedom and security, liberty and safety. Like the president, the president is never going to please everybody, never. But America, at some point soon, he said, weeks, not months, will have to function again. We have to be a country together again and safe again. At times like this, we need more 
not less input from really smart people. And at times like this, think of pre-Iraq war. It's difficult to be the one questioning the consensus. Phenomenal scholars like Stanford epidemiologist John Ioannidis or Yale's David Katz, they're taking a beating for even suggesting that we may need to reconsider some of our initial thinking about this virus and our response to it. They should be heard along with everyone else without censorship. The widely respected Silicon Valley forecaster and statistician Aaron Ginn has uh, had a persuasive and well-argued piece on hope and optimism on the virus removed from the internet. Then it was reposted reposted elsewhere. He's being smeared right now by academics. This is wrong and revealing. The American people in the recent polling, and if it's accurate, they seem to appreciate the way the president has handled this crisis. Day after day, he stood before the press corps, it's not fun, answering questions for hours. His love and his respect for the American people, for our healthcare professionals, and our businesses, our workers, is evident, shines through. He doesn't want our solution to this crisis to end up being worse than the insidious virus itself. That means everyone has to work together. Everyone has to do his or her part. I'll work with anybody to help the American people. I will. I don't care who it is. I'll work with anybody if I feel I'm going to help the American people and the American worker. Can the Democrats who've held up this latest relief slash stimulus bill for the last two days, can they say the same, what President Trump just said? Schumer and Pelosi have been disgusting what they've done to American families and American workers. They're holding the country hostage, trying to extract policy concessions like wind and solar subsidies and you know, mail-in ballots, early voting for the fall. It has nothing to do, zero to do, with COVID-19. We had a deal. I was pretty sure we had a deal last night. If you would have told me at a certain time, like about 9 o'clock, I would have told you we pretty much have a deal. And then all of a sudden it changed, uh, changed fairly rapidly. And, you know, it was unacceptable. It would have been bad for our country. And uh, they were asking for things that would have not been good. I mean, things that, that bore no relationship to what we're talking about. We said, that's not the game. We can't play that game. No, we can't. Because this isn't a game. This is a country. And we're trying to save people, their lives, and in the process, our freedom, our Constitution. We're trying to make hard decisions here with the best information that we currently have, real data. And again, the balancing freedom, security, liberty, safety. But at the end of it all, we still want a country that has a strong chance of being prosperous and happy again. Remember the pursuit of happiness? And that's the angle.